welcome Professor D. Joseph Bhagiraj. Professor Bhagiraj is an agricultural microbiologist. He has uh, left an indelible mark with groundbreaking work on AM fungi and microbial inoculants for sustainable agriculture. His legacy encompasses 541 publications, 11 seminal books, and numerous accolades. As an expert committee of national and international funding agencies, he influences globally. The European Commission sought his input for the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas, underscoring his eminence. A fungus named Globus Bhagiraji, he, that is named in tribute to his monumental contributions. Welcome, Professor Bhagiraj. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the talk I am going to give today is on arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and their role in sustainable agriculture. Okay, we'll go with the slides. <clears throat> yeah. And the word mycorrhiza literally means myco standing for fungus, rhiza standing for root. That means it is a fungus root association, which is symbiotic. And the four main types of mycorrhizal fungi, ecto, vesicular, arbuscular, now called as arbuscular. And uh, these fungi, uh, iricoid and uh, orchid, but the one which is most important in agriculture is the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and also in tropical countries. And so this is <clears throat> the transfer section of a non-mycorrhizal root and this transfer section of a mycorrhizal root. The fungus lives in soil, produces very large spores called as extramatricular spores. The fungus and the hypha penetrates the epidermis, ramifies in the cortex and produces two structures, vesicles and arbuscles. And that's why they were called as vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And some of the genera now we found that they do not produce vesicles, but all of them produce arbuscles. That's why now the name has been changed to arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And we can collect any plant growing in the tropical region. In fact, it's 90% of the vascular plants are colonized by these fungi. So we can bring it to the lab, stain with the crystal violet, and then you can we can fry pan blue, and we can see that they see the beautiful vesicles and also highly branched hyphal structures called as arbuscles. And these fungi, all <clears throat> there are five orders in this, and with 13 families, 41 genera, and 346 species. Though there are 41 genera, the one which are more common in throughout the world are these four genera. A is Glomus, Gygospora, Aculospora, and Gentrophospora. And if you ask me the next question, of these four, which is the most common? It is the glomus. Again, if you just go and collect the soil from your college or the university campus, bring it. I am 100% sure you will get glomus. And these fungi are all obligate symbionts. That means we cannot grow them in artificial media like PDA, Zephaxagar, and so on. So we maintain these fungi in the glass house with the host. So usually grass is usually maintained as the host. This is how we maintain it in my lab. So here uh, each row is one particular species. And in 1976, I think I had a chance to visit University of California with a Fulbright Fellowship. And there I got introduced to mycorrhizal fungi. And when I came back to India, and I could see that practically nothing has been done on a ask arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. I told the students to go and collect the plant samples, to examine the roots, whether they have the mycorrhiza. So this is one of the slide of 1976. You can say they were all colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi. What came with this is the world first report in many crop plants, because the Western world do not grow many crops, what we grow here. So like cardamom, ragi, cinnamon, and so on, all became the world first report. And when I came back from University of California, the professor asked me what gift I can give you. I told him the best mycorrhizal fungus you have. So this is the fungus, Glomus fasciculatum, which, I, which he gave me and I brought to Bangalore. 
and with the sterilized sterilized soil we did this first experiment with bengal gram it was unimaginable increase in plant growth and we said our soil also has got the mycorrhizal fungi so what will happen if we inoculate this exotic fungus to our soil unsterilized soil these are the result you can see in case of groundnut cardamom chili french bean and so on. so we <clears throat> So what makes the plants to grow better when we inoculate with an efficient mycorrhizal fungus? Let us take cotton as an example. So we can see that uninoculated versus inoculated, significant increase in the dry weight. So increase in the phosphorus nutrition, zinc nutrition, manganese nutrition. And so, we, so which very clearly showed that it helps in the nutrition of plants. Here we have to think there are two types of nutrients existing in soil. Some nutrients move very freely in soil solution like nitrogen, potassium. Some nutrients do not move freely in soil solution called as immobile nutrients, example phosphorus. So what happens in the, in the soil? This is the plant, plant root and this is the root hairs which absorb the nutrients from soil. So all the phosphorus that is present in the root hair region is taken by the plant. And after some time, there is no more phosphorus left here. So this we call as phosphorus, phosphorus depletion zone. And here the mycorrhizal fungi play the most important role. They travel much longer distance compared to the root hairs, scavenge a larger volume of soil, take the phosphorus and pump it directly to the host. So they help in the uptake of the immobile nutrients like phosphorus, zinc, copper, and so on. And another being a microbiology lab, we are interested in seeing the interaction between mycorrhizal fungi and the nitrogen fixing bacterium rhizobium. This was a field experiment. What we could conclude from this, there is a synergistic interaction between the two organisms. The mycorrhizal fungi increases nodulation nitrogen fixation by rhizobium, and rhizobium in turn increases colonization and phosphorus uptake by the mycorrhizal fungi, which is reflected not only in the dry weight, but also in the grain yield, which clearly shows dual inoculation is much better compared to single inoculation. This was true even with the phosphate solubilizing bacteria because arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi do not solubilize the insoluble phosphorus in soil, whereas the phosphate solubilizing bacteria and fungi, they solubilize it and in turn, the mycorrhizal fungus takes that available phosphorus. So when a farmer adds rock phosphate to the soil, very cheap source of phosphorus, these phosphate solubilizing organisms solubilize it and the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus takes it. And another aspect which we could see is the in case of groundnut, this is the, we know sclerotium rhodesi is a serious pathogen. So this is the diseased plant and here, the same amount of pathogen plus the mycorrhizal fungus, which very clearly showed that the mycorrhizal fungus helps in alleviating the severity of the disease. We have worked out the mechanism in detail, and it is mainly because of the increased concentration of orthodihydroxyphenols that is present in the mycorrhizal roots. In and around Bangalore, tomato is a very important crop, and we have the root knot nematode problem, which produces tertiary goals. Again, here, when we inoculate with the mycorrhizal fungus, we do not get tertiary calls, we get only primary calls, which shows that the mycorrhizal fungus does not prevent the entry of the nematode, but it prevents the development of the nematode into adult, and thereby protecting the plant against the disease. And I just summed up here the mechanism of improved plant growth by mycorrhizal fungi, increased nutrition because of especially immobile nutrients, synergistic interaction with the other beneficial soil organisms, protecting the plants against soil bone plant pathogens, and also protecting the plants against drought. I'll show you the slide later about the recent work, what we completed. And they also produce growth promoting substances like endolastic acid, gibberellin, and so on. So it's a cumulative effect which makes the plants grow better. And all the scientists, Western scientists have been telling that the mycorrhizal fungi uh, <coughs> can, uh, uh, there is no specificity in mycorrhizal fungi. That means you inoculate ragi with the mycorrhizal fungus, take the fungus, inoculate banana, it will colonize banana. From banana, take it, inoculate neem, it will colonize neem. There is no cross specificity. 
is one of the very early one student of mine did this experiment. This is Lucina leucocephala. This is uninoculated control in you know, the same plant species inoculated with different species of mycorrhizal fungi. So what we could see here that this particular fungus is the best for inoculating Lucina leucocephala. We introduced a new hypothesis called though there is no specificity, there is post preference in AM fungi. That means we can screen and select the best mycorrhizal fungus for inoculating a particular crop plants, which the Western scientists did not agree. But it came became an advantage to me because the United States Department of Agriculture gave a very big project. The money came in dollars. I could help many students. What they wanted is at the end of the fifth year, if your hypothesis is correct, we want the best mycorrhizal fungus for inoculating Lucina leucocephala. So this is what happened after the five years research. So we selected one fungus which works on all the cultivars of Lucina leucocephala grown in Karnataka. So this happened to be Glomus mossy. And this is the difference in case of the root system. And when this work was going on, the director general of the ICFRE Deradut came and he said, can the mycorrhizal fungus bring this much difference in plant growth? We are going to give you a project. We want the best mycorrhizal fungi for inoculating various tree species. So I have just included one slide here of the teeth. You can see the difference in the growth. And we have selected it for various forest tree species like Keshari, Lotica, Ariculiformis, Cashodina, and so on. And then the <clears throat> horticulture department came to us and they said, we want the best mycorrhizal fungus for inoculating various horticultural plants. We have done this. And the medicinal plants board came to us again with another project. They want the best mycorrhizal fungus for inoculating various medicinal plants. And we have done this also for various plants. And after selecting the best mycorrhizal fungus, the next question is, what is the practical application of it? So here we developed the phosphate response curve. So the x-axis with the different levels of phosphatic fertilizer and the y-axis, we have the plant biomass. This is the mycorrhizal plant. This is the non-mycorrhizal plant. To produce this much of biomass, the non-mycorrhizal fungus requires this much of phosphorus. Let us say 20 kg per year. The mycorrhizal fungus to produce the same amount of biomass requires less phosphorus, that is, let us say 15 kg. That means we can save 5 kg of phosphatic fertilizer. So this was the important point, which we have done it in several crop plants in the field. And I have just included one. This is in case of chili. The recommended dose of phosphatic fertilizer is 70 k 5 kg P per hectare. And we have reduced it to half, 50 percent, various mycorrhizal fungi. You can see the, the yield of chili, 2.14 with 50 percent. And with the recommended level is, is this, which very clearly showed we can reduce 50% of phosphatic fertilizer. Another question is how simple it is to apply the mycorrhizal fungus by the farming community. In case of cities, you know that the farmers do not raise the seedlings. They go to a nursery man and buy the, buy the seedlings and plant it in the field. So this is asparagus, so which is raised in root trees or rain. And here, it can mix the mycorrhizal fungus with the substrate, raise the seedlings, and which, which can be bought by the farmer, and it can be planted in the field. Very simple technology. At this time, the ICR came to us with another problem. They said, in case of citrus rootstocks, the rootstocks remain in the nursery for 24 months. Before they reach the stock, reach, they become pencil thickness when it is ready for grafting. Can mycorrhizal fungus help in reducing this period? So we did this experiment and with the various mycorrhizal fungi. And this was the best mycorrhizal fungi. And we could now give this. In 18 months, the rootstocks were ready for grafting, saving six months time. The floriculture paper came to us. How it will be useful? Mycorrhizal fungi will be useful. I have just included one figure. This is in chrysanthemum. You can see the increase in flower number. Not only that, the flowers started flowering three weeks early. Somehow the floriculturists were more interested in that. 
and at this time the post harvest technology department the professor came to her she said can i take these flowers and put it in the flower vase and let us see whether they can last longer and she came and told me daily mycorrhizal flowers lasted three days more in the flower vase now this has been certified with various flowers in different parts of the world and another problem came with the cashew again uh, icr came to us with this problem and said uh, in case of cashew the the farmers raised the seedlings in poly bags and they after the they developed the seedlings are planted in the main field and what they find is 40 percent mortality 40 percent mortality 100 seedlings they plant 40 of them die so they said whether mycorrhizal fungus can help so this was done in the cashew research station of Atulla near Mangalore. And here you can see when they were inoculated with the mycorrhizal fungus, Aculus for a latest, the survival was 100%. Same with Lomas etunicatum compared to uninoculated plants, which is, this is a technology which the cashew growers are following regularly. And the tissue color, the tissue culture people came to us, how will the tissue culture plants help? And we could see the difference in case of uh, cow, uh, where the uh, banana, if the fungus was introduced at the time of uh, hardening. So you can see here, we, then we developed a new concept, microbial consortium. In addition to mycorrhiza, we can add other beneficial soil organisms. So here, the mycorrhizal fungus plus the PGPR, we have added, you can see the difference. And Mycorrhizal helper bacteria helps mycorrhizal activity. The best one was Pseudomonas fluorescens and increase of mycorrhizal colonization. And with the microbial consortia concept, and we have developed this in case of nursery plants in root trailers, brinjal, and you can see the consortium inoculated. This much difference. And the farmers, the nurserymen came and told me earlier we were selling at the rate of one rupee per seedling. Now we can sell at the rate of two rupees per seedling. And this we have done with very hot, many horticultural crops. A DBT came with another problem and gave us a project. In case of tomato and capsicum, wilt disease is a very serious problem in Karnataka. And this it is caused by three pathogens, a fungal pathogen, a nematode pathogen, and a bacterial pathogen. So whether it can be controlled by a control aspect, we developed the mycorrhizal fungus, the pseudomonas fluorescence, plus another nematode trapping fungus, Pesilomyces lilacinus. It can produce very healthy seedlings. The seedlings were planted in the wilt sick soil, and then they performed extremely well. And this is again a technology which has been given to the capsicum and tomato growers. This is an aromatic plant. This is pacholi, which is used for uh, extracting the scent, the perfume. And this is grown in one of the districts of Karnataka. And so there is a buyback arrangement with the industry. And with, for these people, we developed a microbial consortium. And consisting of the mycorrhizal fungus, various other beneficial soil, soil organisms, the perfume is extracted from the oil content. So here you can see with the recommended dose of fertilizer, the oil content is 2.92. With 50% of the reduced for fertilizer, the oil with the inoculation, this is the thing. So this is a technology, again, it is followed by the farming community. The same thing happened in case of chili also. We have reduced the 50% of the NPK fertilizer. With 100% NPK, this is the fruit yield. With 50%, this is the fruit yield, which was done in the farmer's field. And, and again, a medicinal plant, coleus force coli, was introduced in all the southern states with a buyback arrangement with a pharmaceutical company with, with only mycorrhizal fungus. The disease index in this particular plant was 85%. With mycorrhizal fungus alone, it was 68%. With mycorrhiza plus trichoderma viridae, it came down to 33%. Again, a consortium works better. This is what I was telling you about water stress, how the mycorrhizal fungi helps the overcoming drought. So here you can see it's a water stressed uninoculated soya bean, water stressed but inoculated soya bean. The stress was introduced at two stages, 35 to 60 days after sowing, 85 to 100 days of sowing. You can see the difference. And 
this we have taken it and significant difference in total dry weight, seed weight, harvest index, you can see that significant differences. And at this time, if, if, if a farmer came and asked us, can the grown up plants, uh, can we inoculate grown up plants with mycorrhizal fungi? And he said that I have a 10 year old mulberry garden, can I inoculate? So we did this experiment for his sake, and then we showed that even if we introduce the mycorrhizal fungus in the root zone of papaya, cinnamon, mulberry, you can get increased growth and yield. And somehow the <coughs> planning commission wanted me to attend their meeting as a special invitee, and they wanted the economics of it. This is why I prepared it. The, in case of tomato, the yield of uninoculated crop, given 100% of phosphatic fertilizer, we get 9,000 kg of tomato with 50% of reduced phosphorus and with the mycorrhizal inoculation, this is safe. That means the farmer gets 1,400 kg more tomato. And we know the tomato price varies very much in, in, in Bangalore. So we have taken 25 rupees as per kg and that means the farmer gets 36,875 rupees more. So they were very much impressed that is how it was introduced as a thrust area of research. And later we have done it with, uh, with various tree species because the one question that was asked, your PhD students have done your experiments with 100 inoculated and 100 uninoculated plants. How will it, will it happen with thousands of seedlings with the nursery men? We have done this with 9,000 seedlings. And of course, the Karnataka Forest Department gave us all the help and the labor. So that is how we could do with 9,000 seedlings. And we could see that uninoculated versus inoculated in Tectona grandis dalpaja sesu and acacia reclifomis. And they were planted in a place in a degraded uh, forest area. You can see there how the soil is. And this is one year old Tectona grandis. And this is 52 months old Dalbadia sisu. This is a forest nurseryman. He looks big. And he is, when he is standing before the inoculated plant, he becomes small because the tree is very big. And so this technology uh, for a project funded by DST. Now the DST wants us to take us to, to all the states in the country. I don't know how we are going to do it. We have now a Indo-Swiss collaborative project with a very new concept. When we grow into crop of a deep rooted plant with a shallow rooted crop, this is a red pigeon pea, red gram with a deep rooted plant. And this is a ragi, it's a shallow rooted plant. And there is dry soil at the top, where is water, wet soil at the bottom. Can the deep rooted plant take the water from the deep areas, transfer the moisture to the shallow rooted crop, which is referred to as bioirrigation? And this initial experiments were done at Switzerland using deuterium labeled water and they could say yes it can transfer now we are doing the pot culture experiments and we, this uh, rabi season we are taking the field experiments i am keeping my fingers crossed see how it works under field conditions the same results of it. and we also conduct some training to the farming community nurserymen if needed coming to the conclusion at the time of independence there was shortage of food we were and we were expecting the food come from US through PL 40 schemes. And thanks to Green Revolution, high yielding varieties were introduced and we got enough food. But what happened? Heavy doses of fertilizers and pesticides were used for, to produce enough food. And after several decades, now we realize that our pesticides and heavy dose of fertilizers are, are spoiled the environment. Now we are concerned about sustainable agriculture, where we recommend less chemicals and more biologicals. Here, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and microbial inoculants play a very important role. They are cost effective, environment friendly, and they are a boon to farmers, especially in developing countries like ours. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box that will help me to answer. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, I can. So there are some eight people, participants who want to ask questions, but uh, due yeah. to the paucity of time, we will allow only four questions. Okay. I, hope it, I hope it is okay with you. Yes. Okay. Well, I would like to request Mr. Vijay Reddy to ask his question. Uh, 
Good morning, sir. Uh, I want to know what is the compatibility of your uh, uh, glomus with the uh, by beneficial bacterial uh, agents like, uh, as you mentioned, digebium, these things, Japonicum, you have mentioned. I want to know what is the compatibility. Sir? I showed you the result that shows that they are compatible, isn't it? Without compatibility, how can they increase growth and yield? I told the reason also how the mycorrhizal fungus increases rhizobium and how rhizobium increases the Then, Bundan Sharma, please ask your question. Uh, hello, sir. So, my question yes. was uh, you mentioned that these. Uh, AMF can be only associated with cereal plants generally. So how do we, if you want to do molecular identification, how do we isolate and sequence them? Yeah, it's not only associated with cereal plants, it is associated with, I told 90% of the vascular plants. Yes, yes. Okay. That is first thing. And second thing is where mostly morphological and identification was followed. But now, uh, recently, some attempts have been made for the molecular analysis of, of some AM fungi. Though it is not for all the AM fungi, for some fungi, we do have the molecular analysis. But can we culture them on plate, on media? We, there is a cult, uh, thing called root organ culture, where we can um, grow the roots under sterile conditions in the root organ medium. Okay, Mirshik okay. is medium, for example. And then inoculated with the surface sterilized um, mycorrhizal spore, and there they can spore it. And again, the fungal, fungal spores and fungal spores are multinucleate. So, but we can do the molecular analysis with single spore. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Dr. Priyan Singh, please. Ms. Rupinder Kaur. Ms. Priyanka Bharadwaj, please ask your question. Uh, good morning, sir. Sir, were mycorrhiza were having any effect on disease? Yeah, the, it is uh, it's used extensively in the biological control of soil bone plant pathogens. I can give lectures on that only, that as subject. Yeah. <laughs> So, in case of ornamental plants, in case of ornamental yeah, yeah. plants, was there any effect on post-harvest disease? As the fruits, and uh, as the flowers that you show were uh, quite healthy. What is? Uh, so, were they what having is? any effect on uh, post-harvest disease? As the pot you show were uh, show was very healthy. Uh, post harvest, not much has been done. But uh, the, what has been done is about the uh, the vast life that has been done because of the reduced ethylene oxide content. That is the only thing I could see. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Gina, Mr. Uh, Gina Mistri, you can ask your question. Abhiya Adaini, please ask your question. Yes, uh, sir. I would like to ask, uh, sir, in field condition when you're inoculating the plant with the AMF, uh, there might be possible that there are other microbes in the field. So do those microbes affect the growth promoting activity of AMF? Uh, <clears throat> there are. We have, that is why we have to screen and select the most efficient mycorrhizal fungus for a particular crop plant. It works very well. Even otherwise, there is a competition. But um, we see, usually, what people have seen is a synergetic interaction with the beneficial organisms. Okay, Dr. Sir, thank you, sir. Dr. Avinash Jagdup. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor okay. Just Bhagiraj. Thank you for your bright smile and, uh, and, uh, and uh, keeping us uh, always positive about uh, scientific research. And uh, I am sorry we, we, we may not may be able to take more questions today. Uh, no, no, sorry, no, no, sorry, no, sorry. We cannot take any more questions because of the positive okay, uh, fine, time. Uh, but you can always interact with him um, on his email or maybe in WhatsApp group of my yeah, Asia. Sure. Uh, sorry, my India. You. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Now I will. Now we will move on to the third speaker, Professor and uh, Professor Dr. Vijayalata Rastogi. Uh, I welcome Vijayalata Dr. Vijayalata Rastogi uh, to the 
today's program. Madam, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I yes. can hear you. Yes, madam. Yeah, thank you very much for joining in today and agreeing to give the presentation on clinical fungi, especially if public awareness about it. Uh, 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 so 